Oh, yes. Here we are again on a live stream. I suppose you guys have been noticing I've been doing more live streams lately. The reason is I don't have to spend three days editing a video. And so I'm able to upload more interesting content and talk to you guys live when you do tune in. I reckon most of you guys are at work at the moment, but for those of you who are being bad and sneaking off on your lunch break and want to watch a switch optics out, here I am. So what we have here is we have the APA. If you remember this deal, this is the American Precision Arms, uh, Jefferson, Georgia, I believe. And this is the 260 Remington uh, Genesis is what it says on here. Pretty good optic. American Precision Arms, or pretty good rifle, American Precision Arms. You guys remember the, the couple of beta tests we've run so far? We've been shooting water bottles with this thing over a thousand yards and all that kind of fun stuff and uh, did a few groups with it. It'll keep five shots in there pretty tight. So we're going to use this rifle for now because it's such a reliably accurate rifle platform, this APA here, is I'm going to take my beloved Schmidt and Bender PM2 off of there, and then I'm going to put this scope right here, the Athlon Ares ETR, okay? We're going to put that on there. So we're going to switch from the Schmidt Mender PM2 5-25 to with the, P, the P4 Fine Reticle Rex is dropping optics. That's part of the review process. I'm guessing what guys are going to do when they buy a scope. And I'm guessing also what the UPS guy does when he delivers your scope. Or when he delivers the scope to the gun store. And then the, the child working at the gun store delivers the scope to the shelf. So that's all this kind of rough handling business we're doing. We'll see if she's going to fit on there. These are both 34 millimeter main tubes. Uh, so we got the difference in size here. I'm just going to balance it on there. Hopefully we don't uh, kill it. Okay, so there's the PM2. Versus the uh, Athlon 4.5 to 30 by 56. Uh, the Athlon has, you know, in, in terms of features, a little more spread on the uh, the magnification range. Of course, the Schmidt and Bender PM2 is the king for a long time, and uh, I am the Tibor Source Rex, which, by the way, you all you know what that means. So. This Schmidt Bender shall probably come back to live on this particular rifle because this APA is so nice that it's got to warrant the very finest in German optics. Also, my friend Deadlift Klaus and myself, Deadlift Klaus, you know him? We, uh, we have kind of a, a common commonality there when it comes to German optics. He's convinced me that the German engineering is superior. So, but we're gonna see how this thing works. You know, it's interesting, China has been catching up so much with Japan, particularly. Uh, the scope I'm about to put on here, I do believe is made in China. The, uh, what do you call this thing? <laughs> the Ares ETR, Athlon. This is one of their Chinese line. Uh, the Japanese lineup is over on my seven millimeter 300 right now. And that's uh, getting its little testing done. And so, you guys are wondering what tools I'm using here. This is Fix-It Sticks. Uh, these are nice. Right now, I don't have any of the ratcheting mechanisms because I'm just taking these screws out. Um, but they're nice because you can actually get consistency. Uh, some of the tools where you got to adjust the uh, torque, like inch pound of torque, are not as consistent as a separate part that is built specifically for that exact torque rating. And we'll show you that in a minute if you guys want to see them. So I'm going to take these off. I do believe these rings are kind of support. I'm superstitious. I like to keep the cap that was here the same orientation as it was here. Okay. We're going to very carefully remove my deer scope. So I know where to put it here approximately. Here's the old Schmitty. The Schmidt and Menner PM2 has left the building. Made in Germany. Okay, now we're going to put on the Athlon 4.5 to 30 by 56. Kind of similarly configured. I mentioned when I opened the boxes that the feel of the turrets on this optic were very similar to the Schmidt. And we can actually demonstrate that real quick for you guys. Okay, 
So here's the Schmidt. Here's the turrets. Now, if, you want, if you're one of those guys that gets all excited about audible, tactile clicks and all that business, let's, uh, let's give her a spin. They're very close together. And they're very, uh, what I would call, acute clicks, okay? Now let's go with the old uh, Athlon here. Okay, I'm doing a side-by-side -side with the Schmidt, which I know the Schmidts are tier one, man. You can't get much better than a Schmidt. Um, yep, okay. The Aries ETR, in terms of how nice the clicks feel, is more acute, more solid, more precise uh, feeling tactile clicks than the Schmidt, believe it or not. All right. We're going to put her in here. And now we're going to see if the thing works. That's the test. And Athlon, if I were you guys, I'd be sweating like really hard because I am captain reality when it comes to optics reviews. And right now, right now I'm live on the desktop, so you ain't going to see me shoot it yet. But I am going to shoot it on the range here. Today is my plan. And if this thing works, I'm going to find out. I'm going to use the box to bench precision targets. And I'm going to set, see if this thing is tracking precisely. And if it ain't, everyone's going to know. So we will see. And if it ain't, we'll tell you how to make it still work. Because in all reality, there's not a whole lot of stuff that uh, does track with 100% precision. But uh, if this thing is reliable and close in terms of precision, we'll compare it. Because I've got a lot of data. I've been hanging out with these guys for a long time now. Uh, I've got a lot of information. I've got a lot of stats built up at the classes. Of course, my 30 plus year shooting experience and uh, the hundred grand or more that I've spent on my own stuff over time is uh, a good backdrop for information. I know this is exhilarating, isn't it guys? Watching Rex spin the little screws in. <laughs> so there's a little deal here on the fix it stick and you can just kind of hold it and it's actually as fast as I... I actually see people use these things, which is handy if you're in a hurry. However, I don't like to cross thread things. So I like to do it by hand, especially on rings as nice as on here. Let me show you after a little bit here, the rings on the American Precision Arms is their own rings and their own base. And they have a very different design than some other rings that you guys might be familiar with. And so, um, they're very, very repeatable. And we'll test that. We might as well test that while we're at it too, right guys? We'll test the rings and see how good they do. Okay, so now what I'm going to do, this is, uh, to, you guys are probably wondering, I'm going to spill this everywhere. <laughs> this is my kit that I carry. It's very small and you fold it up like this. Very easy to carry around. You can actually attach it. There's little belt loops on your sling for your rifle or on your molly gear or whatever. And uh, this is my Fix-It Sticks kit, okay? I have all different kinds of little bits. I keep a couple of them special Allen or Starhead wrench deals in there, the weird size ones. And um, now I'm just looking for the correct torque spec. I got several different torque deals as the 45 inch pounds. Ah, I probably could do that, but I didn't do that much. I don't like to get too Western on the rings. I've broken too many in my life. I like to get her what they call good and tight. It's a methodology for tightening uh, screws. Gluten type is German. Uh, German engineers who have so much wrench time, they can tell um, just from their hands if it's gluten type. But I'm going to use the old wrench here for the purposes of testing. Otherwise, some guy will say, Rex didn't check the torque. He crushed it and the erector tube broke. Even if that were the case, then I would say make your, make your scope more heavy duty. But uh, I don't think we're going to have a problem. I just don't want to over torque or anything, okay? I like consistency. Consistency is the key, boys. Plus, if I'm consistent when I put my Schmidt and Mender on here, which I was, because I use this exact tool at this exact torque, when I put that thing back on there, it's going to be in the exact same spot. I'm, I'm probably not going to lose zero. Okay? And so we'll test that. Okay? I'm doing the old cross pattern deal here. 
I had the problem wondering. Rex didn't even check to see if it's aligned. Well, guess what? I am Rex. <laughs> it's actually perfect. <laughs> Man, I am good. I haven't lost my touch yet, boys. I've done this more than once. I didn't even look at it before I started to tighten it down at all. I didn't look at the reticle. I just put the scope on there, and I knew that it was going to be good. It actually is perfect. Less than less than one degree off if I were to measure it. Okay. All right. And we'll we'll show you some of the stuff here in a minute, boys. I just want to get this mounted on so that I can actually drive out there and shoot this sucker today because it is a beautiful day. It's like 60 degrees out, which is very rare. It's what we call up here. I don't know if it, the term is PC nowadays, but they call it Indian summer, which means that it froze hard, killed off all the bugs. Fall is fully in swing. It should be pretty much wintertime. We did get some snow, but now it's like almost summertime again. Beautiful time of the year to go out because them skeeters won't get you. Oh yeah, so we're mounted up. All right, for those who just tuned in, we are looking at the American Precision Arms. This isn't a 260 Remington. This is the Rex 01 configuration. Uh, this one is specially made for yours truly. This has a manner stock on it. You guys all like the manners, right? It has a smart adjustment deal for the cheek piece. I like how this is. You got one screw you turn and then you bring it up here. Uh, you do need a tool to adjust that. Uh, sometimes it's nice to have the knob, you know, but uh, it's nice also not to have the knob come loose and get in the way, right? So that's a popular deal. Uh, this, from when I first, in, by the way, check out, they got their own bottom metal. American Precision Arms has their own bottom metal. I'm going to drop this magazine out onto the table. There's a switch right here on the trigger guard. Watch it carefully. See that switch, guys? Pretty cool, huh? And, of course, it runs these AI mags. I got a million of them, so... That's what I run. Yeah, it's an actual authentic AI mag. If you guys want to have that discussion someday, maybe we can do a video. And right now I got a Harris on there because I got a sling swivel stud on here. And uh, I think they gave me, I forget which contour barrel I asked for. It looks like a heavy sucker. I think it's MTU. And we got the APA muzzle brake on there, which is awesome. We like that. Uh, extremely loud, but zero recoil at all. And uh, these are built on one of them, uh, what do you call them, a Defiance Deviant kind of action, one of those scary sounding name actions. Uh, it's a Remington 700 style configuration executed in a completely different way. We have the bolt uh, release button is right here. Um, and it is one of the very popular, you guys know what I'm talking about. It's one of them popular, you know, nipping at the heels or maybe, you know, like just right in the same line as Surgeon and and those other guys that make uh, the, the good actions. Um, so actually, this is the first one where I've had significant trigger time on. I mean, I've shot them before a million times, but this is the first one where I've been able to actually use it. And I'll tell you what, this gun shoots amazingly straight. I got a bunch of 140 grain burger hunter VLDs, I think, loaded up that the wife loaded for me. I, still, I think I still got 50 rounds left before I have to load again. So I'm gonna use that ammo, uh, some reloads, and uh, it runs a little bit tight, but tight is a good thing when you're trying to shoot straight, but it's very smooth, it's very nicely smooth. I did use some of that accuracy oil from Modern Spartan Systems or whatever you call that outfit. Um, and that's, uh, so I got some accuracy oil on there, um, but she's, she's smooth, nice and smooth. I like to do that just so I don't have to clean it. It like reduces your cleaning a lot, and I'm a guy that hates cleaning anything, so my stuff gets dirty, and, and then I clean it later. So that's that deal. We now have removed, for those just tuning in, the PM2 and replaced it with the Ares ETR, okay? Now, from looking at this before, the reticle in here is very nicely configured. It's very fine reticle. I like how it's balanced out, and it's relatively clean. It's not super complex. I don't like too much complexity for my style of shooting, okay? We talk about that if you come to one of our training deals. We talk about how the human inner brain interfaces with different tasks that you're trying to do and how the visual stuff that you're seeing as a shooter, you know, how to prioritize things. And um, we'll talk about that later. 
Um, but yeah, this is their more budget side uh, for their 34 millimeter scope. So we're gonna try this one first. If any of them are gonna take a dump, this will be the one. And uh, this scope is made in China. The one I just took off is made in Germany. So when we did the testing on this rifle before, it was shooting all of them in the same hole, five shots in a row every time, and just drilling water bottles when I dial it in. At, I forget how far we were, like, I don't know, a thousand-ish, somewhere in there. And, uh, you know, getting second and third round hits on water bottles. And so this sucker shoots good, but we just changed optics. So I'm going to go out there today, and we'll see how she goes. I'm going to put her on the box to bench precision target and uh, do a tracking test. Not a super high tracking test. We're just going to see if it's completely foobar. <laughs> to do a proper tracking test, by the way, guys, I'll make a full video on that when I redo the one-on-one -on -one series. We're going to redo that at some point whenever I hire somebody to help me with the media side of things because I've been swamped with media. Like, it's un unbelievable in a good way. It's just... Uh, but uh, once we get someone to help me with the media, I'm going to redo the one-on-one -on -one series. That's my evil top-secret plan that you shouldn't tell anybody about. Because now I'm better at, at video editing, right, guys? That's why I do live streams. Because <laughs> to make a good edited video takes, like, a lot of time and sweating and yelling and throwing chairs out the window because the computer doesn't work, right? So here we go. We'll take some questions real quick here. And then we can show you some of the other stuff I got going on. And we will, we're going to then floor it out of here. And I'm going to drive out on the 100-yard range and test this bad boy. Athlon is garbage, is a comment. We shall see. Aries ETR, yep. Thank you, primary arms versus Athlon. Yeah, we'll see. I've tested lots of primary arm scopes, guys. Um, I do believe that the Japanese one over here that I have from Athlon is the same factory as everybody else, like Night Force and everyone else. I'm pretty sure by looking at it, I can tell you that it's probably LOW out of Japan. Um, so same parts. And when I take it apart, I'll know for sure. Um, so you got to remember when you're comparing brand names, guys, these guys typically don't build their own scopes. They have them configured. They go through quality control. They get them put together in a certain way. And they produce, uh, they, they outsource everything, right? Most, most guys do. Pretty much everybody, even Leupold and everybody else. That's kind of their normal operating procedure. So if you're if you have a loyalty towards one brand or another, I would say you might want to think about having more of a loyalty towards one model or another. Because this scope is branded by Athlon. It's made in an entirely different country as the scope over there that's branded by Athlon, right? Same thing with primary arms. Same thing with almost everybody. Heck, Zeiss. Zeiss has stuff that's made in Wetzlar, Germany, which is incredible. And they have some in the Conquest line, the more affordable stuff, that's slight Asian, you know? So do keep that in mind. I rant about that a lot. I need to do some reloading, but I need a good scale. My 5 to 10 is inconsistent as hell. Oh, that sucks. I still use an old analog Forster that I got. It's probably 50 years old. Rex, hey man, I literally, literally just signed... For my Valdada Recon G2 in the mail. Can you cover quick scope ring and mount up tips? Best way to level reticle. Okay, so on the uh, IOR Valdada, I don't got one laying on the table. It's actually right over there. I got the G2 right over here within 10 feet of me. Um, but the rings that come with it, you're talking, probably talking about them clamshell rings. Those things work really good, but once you get that reticle level, and you start tightening the rings, what you're going to see is it's going to start turning the top of that reticle. It's going to pull a little bit left when you get your final tightening. So I'll give it like a degree of a cant to the right. And then as you tighten it, it'll pull it straight. And we'll do a whole video on how to get everything level. And just being level ain't the name of the game, guys. There's a lot of other things you got to do to truly get it level. Especially if you're using a bubble level. What do you need to level? The reticle? How the tracking goes? Or what? How do you level the rifle? It's a complex topic. When well, it seems complex, it's really not that hard. But we'll do a video on that. Is a 1-6 to six scope good for home defense? Uh, well, if you hit someone over the face with it, it's better than nothing. I prefer to have a shotgun in my home. 
ain't gonna blow holes all the way across the neighborhood or whatever with a shotgun. Um, if you're using a rifle for home defense, I'm assuming you're in the country. Yes, that would be great because then you can take out uh, when the, when the Russians land and they start grabbing, opening up those crates and they get them uh, PKM machine guns out and there. Before they have their stuff together, you can keep her on one power and take out the guys within 100 yards and then put her on six power for the guys, you know, out there to six or 800 yards. If you're running like a, a Raptor or something like that, the primary arms Raptor. <laughs> Rex is going to be bad. He's too crazy. Mm-hmm. One to sit, yeah, okay. So, I don't know, guys. I, I'm going to show you some of the other uh, stuff I got on the table here before I floor it because I actually do want to go outside. I don't want to sit in the kitchen anymore. Um, so, I got old Blinky. Remember old Blinky? The T1000 made by Magneto Speed. These Velcro that peak just around the bottom of the edge or the top edge of your target. And when they get hit by a bullet, it blinks at you. Did you see the blinking? Pretty cool, huh? We got the Accuracy Solutions... TAC 3 extended dealing, and we'll show you that a little more later. Uh, we got all kinds of fun stuff. I, hey, my World War III rifle, uh, the one that we're having custom built with the Macmillan A5, that is uh, actually in progress. My man has it under control. He's going to, you know, I figured I got that Remington AC. He's got to pull the barrel off of there anyways to redo. I like to have him redo how the muzzle attachment is on there. And uh, so he's just going to chew it up and get it all. No, a little accuracy job. We're going to be using Remington parts, factory Remington AC parts, but he's going to chew it up for me. Uh, but that sucker is in progress, ready to go. And we're gonna, on that rifle, we're going to have the HUD DMR 3 to 18 coming soon to a city near you. So that's what's around the corner here. Hey, did you see these? This is Muddy River Tactical. Okay. I got my old 1911 in there. And this has been my standard carry piece for a long time, okay? Uh, she is hot and ready to rock and all that stuff, and she's all lubed up. I actually did start lubing all my handguns with that accuracy oil after I stripped them all the way down to the bone. Because in the wintertime, like if this sucker is on a holster that's outside the waistband and, and it's exposed to the air, like you can't run thick grease on a pistol in the wintertime up here. It will die. It will never run properly. So accuracy oil, I basically coat it down, all the rails and all the stuff that you need to, to oil up, and then I wipe it almost all the way off. So it's like a micro thin layer of oil. It's almost basically dry. Just wipe it off. And uh, that's for ultra cold weather. We should do an extreme cold weather weapons maintenance techniques and tips video. That'd be fun, wouldn't it? Uh, so what else do I got to show you guys? No, I'm going to go out to the range, guys. I ain't going to sit here much longer. All right, we'll take three more questions and we're out of here. Cold out in West Texas? <laughs> oh, man, I would love to move to West Texas. It just In the summer, it gets a little hot, but it's a dry hot, so it's not too bad. I mean, up here where we're at, it'll get up to 110, you know, um, but it's a dry heat, so it ain't that bad. That humidity is what kills me. I'm from the high plains of Montana. Yeah, see, so yeah, kind of what I'm talking about. Eastern Montana, especially, is pretty rough in the winter time. The mountains is actually pretty mild compared to like that, where the where the Arctic winds come down on the eastern part of Montana and it comes all the way, loops all the way down North Dakota into South Dakota a little bit, and then up all, all the way around Minnesota and part of Wisconsin. That part of the country, just pay attention during the Weather Channel. It's consistently horrible up there in the winter time. Ah, check out the new Steiner military. I am on it, guys. Hey, Sarge, how you doing, cowboy? <laughs> Home defense, 50 BMG for UFOs. That's a good target, guys. All right, that's a good topic. That's a good topic. I actually know a guy that did shoot at, shoot at UFOs, like flying saucers back in the 60s. <laughs> did I ever tell you that story or what? You guys want to hear the story? I know a salty old character, and you'll probably watch this video. He's probably watching it now. Uh, maybe he's not. He's actually not a computer guy so much, but maybe someone will send it to him. But I know him. He has one of these like really small kind of uh, uh, trading post kind of stores in a tiny town in one of the least sparsely or you know like least sparsely populated place in the whole country. Whatever the way of saying there's nobody out there is, 
Like, there's nobody out there. And it's the big town in that area, which is like, I don't know, a thousand people or a few hundred people or whatever. And they got a trading post. They sell guns. And his boy actually got out of the core and went to gunsmithing school and they build rifles. They, they've done some of my, uh, my rifles down there. Like my, uh, uh, which one? My 308 in the uh, AICS chassis. That was done by him down there. Oh, well, we're talking about UFO interdiction. Okay. So back in the day, he tells me, and he's not a guy, I mean, he'll tell some good tales. Um, so I don't know. I still try to read if this is a true story or not. There was this one scary place called Sunset Butte. Actually, the same butte where they dug out a giant Tyrannosaurus Rex back in the 90s because they had a, uh, they had to put in a new road. And so when they're doing the road cut, they found a T-Rex there, one of the big ones that, that's in the museums. They actually haven't dug up a lot of T-Rexes, guys. There's only been a few. Um, so there's only been a few ever found. That's one of them. Uh, but at that butte, um, if you go to another place, there's called Spooky Draw, is what they call it. And it's right in that territory. And uh, one night back in 1969 or whenever it was, 1968, and he's not your drug-taking kind of guy, so he wasn't hallucinating or nothing. He's a pretty, uh, he would be what you call maybe on the oil field, the biker edge of the spectrum, whatever that is. And so maybe, I don't know if he was a kid back then, but uh, anyways, a flying saucer came out, according to the story, and he was driving his pickup, and he saw this flying saucer next to Butte, like on that movie that came out way later. And uh, according to the story, he pulls out his H&R 9-shot 22 revolver out of the glove box, and he empties it like at, like, I don't know, I don't know what point-blank range, I don't know how big the flying saucer was that he saw. But supposedly, according to the legend locally, he did get some rounds on a UFO. The H&R 9-shot 22 revolver was not enough to take it down. So if you have flying saucer problems, maybe something like a BMG, like a 50, would be advisable. That would maybe have a little more effect. However, I'm kind of guessing that whoever's flying in the flying saucer is smarter than us. And they probably thought of that thing happening. So I probably wouldn't shoot at it. Because you don't know who's flying it. It's either top secret Space Force guys. Okay? It's either that or some other country's top secret guys. Or some people think it's like... Well, there's a lot of theories on what's in the flying. Aliens. I certainly wouldn't shoot at them guys. They'll laser beam you when you're not. They'll do things to you later when, that you don't want to happen. Uh, they'll sneak up on you. They'll, they'll, make, they'll make it up to you. Then they know where you live. So with space aliens, you don't want to mess around with them. So if you start hammering away at a 50, with a 50 caliber at a flying saucer, I mean... <laughs> I did drink coffee, guys. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? <laughs> They're having a conversation on the live stream here. Actually, talking about the topic. <laughs> yeah, FAL, depending on where you live, FAL would be a good one, too. I mean, once once the space aliens come out of the flying saucer and you have a determined... It's always important to know your target. And unfortunately, with space aliens, you don't really know if they're on your side or not. So you want to make a determination. you got to find someone who's one of those kind of... Uh, there's a certain type of person that would want to come up and talk to a space alien, one of the little gray guys with the big black eyeballs. You need to find one of those guys, and you send them up to reconnoiter the situation. And depending on what happens next is how you will determine if you engage or not, is what I would do. And then the FAL would work, I would think, actually pretty well once they get out of the flying saucer. You guys brought it up, not me. <laughs> You guys brought up the issue, not me. But that is a fun topic. 20 millimeter, that's a lot better than a 50. And you guys know that a 20 millimeter, like uh, like the Bushmaster cannons, I think they're shooting like a, how big is the bullet on there? There's a whole bunch of different rounds, but they're in that 2,000 grain range, and they're going like 3,300 feet a second. So if you do have a 20 millimeter, like, uh, what's that outfit they used to build? Those Iron iron Horse or Iron Works or, you know, I forget what they call them. Uh, there were some single shot, shoulder fired 20 millimeters out there. So that would be good for a UFO interdiction as well, guys. That's not the name of this video, though, is it? Sorry when those who just tuned in. <laughs> if you go back in the commentaries, if they're available, someone asked the best caliber for, for UFO interdiction. So, you brought it up. All right. You guys are distracting me. You're trying to make me not leave. You know that I'll get off on a rabbit's trail. Try a 40, a 40 millimeter full auto. Yeah, like a Mark 19. 
that would actually be pretty good. I would feel a lot more comfortable with a 40 millimeter Mark, Mark 19 grenade launcher belt fed against a flying saucer at point blank range. Well, point blank, they won't go off. You gotta be far enough to where they actually go off. They're, you know, there's a centrifugal fuse in those. Um, but if, you, if you're within engagement range, that's gonna do a lot more damage than your H and R nine shot revolver, okay? Uh, in, in the 22 long rifle. All right, guys, I'm gonna go to the range and I'm gonna test out this Athlon Ares ETR. We have a lot of controversy. Folks are saying they're horrible. Some guys are saying they're the best value out there. I don't know, I have no idea. I've never shot one really a lot yet. Guys do bring them to the classes and the ones I've seen in the classes did work. Um, they seem to work pretty good. So we're gonna see how this one works. And then we're gonna uh, test out the other one too. So I have two Athlon scopes in for review where I can take them through my paces and actually make a scientific determination, also combined with all the stats I've been doing from the classes, because I do keep track of how scopes are doing. And once I make a full evaluation of how these things perform, I will report to you the exact facts on um, how they're doing. All right, guys, uh, I'm headed out to the range. I'm gonna be on the road, and we'll catch you on the flip side.